So after trying to fix the how to get slides on the video problem, welcome to my early morning talk on um, how to make your tests fail. Um, randomized testing at the example of Elasticsearch, also the library was initiated at Elastine. Who am I to tell you something about um, testing at Elasticsearch? I happen to be a developer at Elasticsearch GmbH. Apart from that, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, co-founder of Apache Mahout. Hands up if you know Mahout. One, two, okay. Uh, co-founder of Berlin Buzzwords. If you need an exp oh, Wait. Better? Mr. Technician, <laughs> is the microphone working or is there something we can change? <laughs> Something works. Okay, so there's okay. nothing else? Much, much, can, can do much. Okay. Because but, the volume is fixed. Okay. Um, if you need an ex if you need an excuse to tell to have your employer pay for a trip to Berlin, just go to Berlin Buzzwords to learn more about Elasticsearch and Hadoop and search in general and friends. So let's start with a few questions. How many of you write tests? I don't care which one. Still one who doesn't? Okay. They don't code. Do you regularly check code coverage? About half, okay. Like regularly also means once a week, once a month, once every year, I don't care. <laughs> Do you run your tests regularly? Okay, good. So pretty much everything should be fine, right? So all tests are green, everything is a nice, funny little world. Um, when randomized testing was introduced in Lucene, some, someone found very, something very odd. If you call a function that generates an integer between integer minimum and maximum, and then let Java compute the um, absolute from it, that should always be positive, right? Yeah. However, it's exactly. So there's just like one exception to the rule, and that's where you get a minimum value. So although everything your tests um, check looks like a fairly green world and looks like a well-shaped um, object, this is what the, our world actually looks like when we look at our tests. We don't check all the corner cases, and this is where typically our customers find bugs. So. How do we go about um, checking those corner cases? I do have a little child. If you've been here, here earlier this morning, you have seen her. And I don't have a lot of time to um, clean our flat every day or every week. So we looked into automating all of these chores. One of the automations was to buy one of those Roombas. Every night, 5 AM, it starts its work. Every evening, all I have to do is take the garbage out. And this is what I like to do with testing as well. Let me introduce you to carrot search randomized testing. The principle is also known as property-based testing. There's um, many other no names that is known under. If you do have a hacking background, you may be familiar with the term fuzzing. Um, there's also similar ideas at play. Also here, we don't try to specifically uncover um, security holes when confronting the system with unexpected input, but we just try to enlarge the um, space of expected values that we expect expose the system to. So let's take a look at what CarrotSitch supplies us with. It's a framework that generates random numbers, random strings with different properties. It can be ASCII strings, it can be UDF-8 strings, it can be UDF-8 strings with specific um, properties. It can generate specific char characters from specific care sets only. It can go and generate different um, environment settings like changing your locales that your system runs under. 
like imagine running both your systems under development and under t um, on your continuous integration environment with the same locale, but having customers that actually live in China or in Turkey that have a different locale setting and not finding bugs just because you test under the wrong locale setting. So you don't run your tests just with random input because then of course your tests aren't reproducible any anymore. Each test will be based on a reproducible specific seed value and the system will tell you the seed value that the test ran with when it failed so you can reproduce it on your machine. You can repeat one test run multiple times. This makes sense, especially if in the, in the, during the test run you generate different data sets. So having, you have the same um, test setup, the same logic run with different input values. It supports for test timeouts. So when your test happens to run too long, it will kill it and tell you. It detects leaking threats, both in your test environment, but also in your production code. When I tried this out on Apache Mahout, we discovered two or three threat leaks just by running the test suite within the carrot switch randomized runner without changing anything. You can annotate tests, like, like remember those tests in your test suite that were always very annoying because they run multiple minutes. Just put the at nightly annotation to it and it will run them just say on, on your integration system or only when you start the test suite with a specific um, command line switch. Okay, how do I write tests that of which I do not know the input? It only makes sense for a certain type of test. Um, one of those types of tests is when actually checking the result is cheaper than computing it. When is that the case? Imagine a function that sorts integer values. It's very cheap to check that the values that you have are actually sorted, but it's reasonably um, costly to do the sorting. So what you do is you implement your sorting algorithm. In your test, you generate a set of numbers. Uh, you run it through your sorting function, and at the end, ch only checks that your numbers are be have been sorted. That's easy. Another use case for randomized testing is when you know of an algorithm that is slower than the one you implemented, for real, for production, but that is simpler to implement. So you don't have all the fun funky op optimizations in there. You put the slow algorithm in your randomized test, you run that over your generated input, and make sure that the output is identical to your production output. Another easy check is to, if you can think of an algorithm that cheap, that can in a cheap, very cheap way compute the upper and lower bound on the result. Imagine adding A and B as a number. You can make, you can make the assertion that the result of A plus B so should at least be larger than either A or B. If it's lower, then obviously something is wrong. So just Especially for these types of tests, if all you can define is an upper and lower bound on the result, you also, of course, want to make sure to ha also have deterministic tests with specific input um, data to um, check the, the output of your function. This will only give you um, broader coverage in your input data. So what does it look like? After adding the character um, randomized testing dependency to your build, what it gives you is a annotation, a, which we see here below the um, test annotation. Repeat gives you a hint that this test should be repeated multiple times. In this case, iterations equals 100 means it should be repeated 100 times. And this means it's repeated 100 times each with a different input, set, input data set. Why is it a different input data set? That's because over here we generate a random integer value. We can either say give it just an upper bound or we give it a lower and upper bound. We, can, we also have a function to generate just any random integer without the um, bounds. Same here, when we, this is where we generate our data. 
we fill our list with a random short value. Here we don't have the bounds. We could have them if we wanted to. Uh, as explained before, we do the sorting in our sorting algorithm, and in the end, we just check that the um, array is sorted. So to summarize, on the unit test level, we generate input with a fixed seed, so we can repeat our tests if they fail in order to increase the search space for bugs in our code. In, during continuous integration, we can rerun tests to cover as much um, data that as, we, as we want to and as we need. We can even specify to just run the iterations in, during continuous integration and on the local box, just run it on one data set. Okay, so that's the unit test level. At Elasticsearch, we went one step further. Because so far, we only looked at unit tests. Can we cover even more? Of course, we can cover even more. If you think about coding in Java, your clients may run with different JVMs, for instance, or they may run with this different JVM optimization parameters. And if you have a distributed system, you may even want to vary the number of nodes that your system runs on. You may want to vary the number of processes on each of these nodes. In Elasticsearch, we vary the number for each um, test, integration test run, we vary the number of data nodes that, that the um, test cluster consists of in integration tests. And of course, we also vary JVM optimization parameters. We vary the JVMs that we test against. Um, what that led to both in the Lucene world and the Elasticsearch world was to uncover various JVM bugs themselves that lead to index data corruption, that lead to uh, crashes, such that we now can give specific recommendations on which JVM versions up to the uh, minor version we recommend uh, users to run Elasticsearch on. How does that look like for the ELK stack? We have a bunch of machines, both on Amazon um, running in the cloud, as well as hard metal boxes where we don't have a virtualization layer in between. There is on each commit a smoke test. Uh, there's a regular run for J Java unit tests. There's a regular run of tests that go against the REST API. We test on, uh, on not only on different boxes, but also on different operating systems. There's, I rem if I remember correctly, there's Debian, there's Ubuntu, there's CentOS, there's Windows, probably by now even more. Um, we run on different uh, types of cloud instances, like smaller ones, larger ones. So we do have a decent coverage there. To visualize again, we test against Elasticsearch Core being the unit test level. We test against the Java uh, API, Java Client API, and we test against the RESTful API with REST tests. Plus, we do have a backwards compatibility version where we check out a, a random, but um, supposed to be backwards compatible, back, backwards compatible version of Elasticsearch and running both of these in parallel and checking that they are both compatible. Now, what impact does that have on development culture? Actually, the impact is pretty large, and we've struggled quite a bit with stabilizing things in the past, because once you do have randomized testing, if you have a deterministic test with deterministic input and a deterministic <coughs> environment, what you can do is that your developer checks out the code, runs it through, and hopefully if, well, except for Java versions being different and some, some such, but if this test run is green, everything should be fine. However, here, if you happen to have like one, one piece of data set that your developer didn't check on his local box, suddenly it will fail on continuous integration at some point in time. So you need to have some kind of responsibility there to check what went wrong on the continuous integration system and to find the developer who can fix it or have a culture where every, everyone looks there 
and everyone considers it first priority to stabilize the build. Another impact is, sure, you do have a decent test suit right now, but as soon as you, I promise you, as soon as you um, integrate randomized testing in your um, build, your test suddenly will become very flaky, and that's not due to the nature of randomized testing, but due to, due to the, the um, fact that there probably are many bugs in your system right now that you're not aware of. Just to give you two anecdotes, I tried, uh, I tried integrating randomized testing in Mahout. First trouble I ran into, Mahout is built on top of Hadoop, and the, test, the integration tests had been written such that they always wrote to the temp directory in a very specific location. So if you had two build runs in parallel, it would crash. Another thing for Mahout was that the developers relied upon um, not closing threads in the tests. If you have many tests in the same JVM running, that's not very nice. So each randomized test crashed for the thread leakage. And that's not even introducing random data. At a previous employer of mine, I, I played around with randomized testing. So I looked for a class that looked reasonably easy. I did a little bit of geo mask, computing distances and such. So I introduced um, random data there. How hard can it be to find bugs for code that's been running for um, decades? Actually pretty easy. It took one night and we had like two or three cases where it failed. One being the um, dateline, others being bounding boxes that wrap around that no one had thought about because the client apps that were using that particular piece of the code never ran into this issue. But it was just essentially a ticking time bomb until someone in the client um, developing teams would have hit the problem that's down there. So it took, unfortunately, it took weeks to iron out all bugs because like if you if you had fit, fixed one of these issues in that class, it took a week, and then we found another one, another week, we found another one. And that's just because there were either inexperienced developers who didn't think of the boundary cases, or it was developers who were happy to have just their um, computation fixed and they know that it works, so they had like a psychological boundary to look for further issues. And trust me, I've got the psychological boundary as well. I like tests that are green. So at some point in the day, I will stop searching for things that break. So for if you introduce randomized testing, what happens is you don't have this notion of CI breaks and the last committer actually is the one who broke the build because it could as well be that some random generated data set uh, broke the test. So we'll, you will need to have either someone look at it and triage it, or you will have the team do it all together. Depending on the team size, this may take quite a bit of um, time. This, this particular issue can be helped if you have randomized testing in place for long enough, because at some point you will realize that it's easier to um, deal with these issues if you have reproducible errors. Like you shouldn't have tests that rely, rely too much on timing. You shouldn't have tests that rely too much on having all of the system up and running. Right now at Elasticsearch we work heavily towards moving away from having many integration tests towards having just a lot of unit tests so that the um, amount of code that could be broken and that could have caused the issue is being reduced. Another thing you should establish is to teach developers how to write tests that are easy to reproduce. Um, we've had many developers who found it very easy and very uh, rewarding to do these integration tests because if you go to the REST layer and you establish an index, it's very easy in our test testing framework and it's by design very easy to do that so that even customers can do it. However, it also, um, it also like invites developers to just write into integration tests. So you need to, to teach your developers like really go down there, do the unit testing first and get that right. Also, it will uncover bugs in your environment. 
In our case, it uncovered many uh, edge cases in the Java environment. Each time Oracle releases a new JVM, the pre-release version are being run against at least Lucene, but also against Elasticsearch. And it's quite often that we run into, in, into problems that, at the end of the day, may lead to index corruption issues. And that, in Elasticsearch world, means data loss. So we try to uncover these uh, very early. To summarize, randomized test testing is not a silver bullet. It can cause a lot of um, problems to you. So first of all, it can cause a lot of problems because if you introduce it to an established code base, it will uncover many bugs that first you will have to fix. On the other hand, it also can't, cannot replace tests with deterministic data. Like we've tried to come up, we've done some, rep, uh, in our team, we've done some refactoring recently, and we found many cases where just having a, a test with deterministic data is a lot easier in order to check the result and may give you a deeper coverage even because the checks can be more restricted. However, the randomized nature of the test gives you a broader coverage. So my recommendation would be to write traditional unit tests and to add randomized testing in order to cover the corner cases. You can add virtualization in order to cover installation setups. That's what we are about to do right now, like test the whole cycle from check-in up to building a release and the packaging, install, installing the packaging and then running the tests against this installed version so that really become full cycle. Um, one, one note, introducing randomized testing needs a lot of discipline for fixing tests. If you look, for instance, at the um, solar build or at multiple builds that I've seen at companies in-house, you really, really need to go out there and fix these tests quickly because due to the um, fact that we run with random data, what you end up with is a continuous integration test system where the tests become like flickering. They go from green to red to green to red and that's not something that you want to have. That's something where developers very quickly um, stop looking at the continuous integration system at all. So you want it to have always green so that you can rely upon, I checked and I, did, and I didn't break anything. <coughs> Otherwise, if it's sometimes green and sometimes red, people will start thinking, well, maybe it wasn't me. And the other thing you want to um, think about is at Elasticsearch right now, I've told you that we run in the cloud on multiple instances, on multiple operation, operating systems, on multiple JVMs, possibly in parallel. So sometimes you run into the following issue. You do have a reproducible issue, and it fails on every test run. So suddenly you have that ripple effect that you, in the morning you go to the office and you have 10 build failures, and all of them caused by the same issue. You really want to cut that out, otherwise people will start filtering these emails because we really, really can deal with 10 to 20 emails each day just for one build issue. That's not very nice. So if you've looked at your watch, um, this, test is uh, this talk is actually shorter than um, initiate, uh, than, than uh, um, advertised on the schedule. I do have a few t-shirts here. And I do have a little bit of what's called Zucru here that I've been told geeks like very much for fixing things. I would like to ask you, um, A, if you have any questions, but I would like to hand out the t-shirts for the best testing stories that I get. <laughs> <laughs> like if you know my background at FrostCon and at other conferences, what I usually do is it takes a microphone and hand it to everyone to tell them, to tell me their background. I thought so today I'd make it a little bit different. Volunteers. One question. I mean, as I see, this is basically a helper for unit tests. Would you also yeah. recommend that for some kind of integration tests? Yes. Because because then it's, I think it's getting even more pain because yes. sometimes the systems are very complex. And uh, how would you tackle that? I mean, if they 
could easily break all the time. So at Elasticsearch, we do it at, at the integration test level. That in our case, it makes sense because customers run the system in different environments. If you deploy to the same environment with the same database in the back all the time, you don't want to randomize there. It doesn't make any sense unless you want to change the database at some point in the near, in the near time future. In our case, it makes sense because we ship that library out there and people are free to run it on whatever cloud instance, uh, real computers, uh, against whatever JVM system with whatever local settings they have. So we run, actually run our integration tests with that. You're right, it does raise the likelihood of breaking. On the other hand, we also su offer support for customers. So we'd rather have these breakages in the integration test system than in a call where we need to answer within two days. Because these, these are much, you don't have that much pressure to fix such an integration test and you can spend more time analyzing the logs. So in the end, it boils down to two things. A, make your system easier to analyze when something fails, and B, have logging that actually helps you fix the system. And in our case, that even helps in production because those same logs are then available on the boxes of customers and of downstream users to analyze. Okay, thanks. Here's the questions, comments. Or stories. Yeah. Can you handle um, From a technical standpoint, we saw how you uh, call, let's say, uh, test data generators, and we saw the annotation which tells uh, the yeah. environment to repeat the tests. But uh, how, uh, how do you actually build a randomized test? Because it was incomplete, the example. Um, I wouldn't know how to do it myself. The example itself actually was complete because it relies on, a, on the carrot search randomized testing framework. And that gives you the, all the annotations plus functions. And that one also, uh, I, 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 if I remember correctly, it's timestamp based. And that's what generates the seed. And based on that seed, then the data is being generated. Like if you take the, um, if, if you take the Java API, it already has a function for generating random integers. And that's essentially what all this is based upon. Okay. So it's not random integers in the mathematical cryptographic sense of the word, but it's really random as in we generate a bunch of integers. Okay. Here's a question, so sorry. Yeah. I'd like a t-shirt. <laughs> Um, I developed software in New Zealand, um, and I was working there for the Ministry of Social Development. So this is an anecdote. And um, we were building a brand new web application using Google Web Toolkit. And at the same time, one of the managers had this great idea that we should also introduce um, basically end-to-end -end, um, testing. And so we were using a brand new system, using WebDriver, Concordian, to do end-to-end -end UI testing. And it was I was a little bit skeptical in the beginning, thinking, how can this really be greater than all the integration testing we were already doing and all the unit testing? And so, so we went ahead and it was literally a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> At first, we had all these random failures and this went on for maybe four, five, six months. So we were de developing for about a year. And for six months, we were getting these random failures because Selenium was running too fast and our test verifications wouldn't work or there was like a hundred different problems with it. And another team was put, professional automating testing team was put to our side to help us fix all the problems. And in the end, we did. And after about six months, we basically earned the rewards um, because in the end of the project, lots of features had to be developed really quickly and lots of bugs. And basically, the end-to-end -end testing saved our backsides, um, finding all these defects um, as times got a little bit more stressful in the end. But my experience, and that's what I wanted to ask you in the end, is 
it was really only possible because management supported, supported the whole idea. Without management um, accepting that developers spend enormous amounts of time trying to debug defects and also effort trying to keep the morale up because developers work that way. Well, it's failed without reason three times. I don't really want to look at it anymore. It was an enormous investment. And without the backing of management, it wouldn't have been possible. Is that, is that uh, true in your experience as yes, well? it's true. So in our case, we get seed backing mostly because, um, like I explained earlier, having backs in our system actually erases the um, amount of money we spend on support. So doing this kind of testing up front saves us a lot of money in the end. But you're right that developers spend an enormous amount of time fixing these issues, finding these issues, finding the developer who can fix them, and you can't do that without management support. I did work for other companies before where it was a management decision to, yes, we know that such and such configuration can generate a bug, our system won't be down, but the queries won't work. It's our management decision that we won't fix it. So in, in such an environment, establishing deep integration testing with randomized input probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you don't have the um, idea that you want to fix it in the end. It will only make your build more unstable. Any other stories? <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, uh, just a recent case uh, in our integration tests, uh, we uh, did find uh, a strange issue with uh, creating of some entities um, through uh, Jenkins. Uh, it, uh, it ran um, red all the time, though uh, on our um, personal machines it was green. So um, it. Uh, uh, it showed us that um, in Jenkins we, we, we used like um, not um, not not really integrated environment because we took uh, HSQL so HyperSQL to uh, to create the entities and um, it uh, the driver was um, uh, dealing with uh, the creating of a, of a sequence uh, through the sequence annotation and. Um, uh, it, it was stricter than uh, the, the creating of, of the sequence in our environment. Uh, we had a, a, like an Oracle driver. So the Oracle, Oracle driver um, um, took, uh, took the, um, uh, took the uh, uh, annotation without parameters. And uh, on our machines, it uh, created uh, the uh, the entities somehow, but HSQL was like um, bugging about uh, about it all the time. Uh, so it helped us uh, to. Uh, it, 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 it was just an issue with uh, with other environment that showed us uh, that uh, that we have we, we have to uh, to use different uh, 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 take a look on different drivers to to see that uh, the software can fail uh, because because the drivers uh, work uh, differently. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just a recent issue. We we we, we have uh, had uh, these cases um, commonly. Uh, that um, yes, uh, the integration tests uh, show show uh, show us that uh, you really have to have to look uh, on the on the on di uh, different ki kinds of environments. <laughs> So, one more story. Mm, yes, in our project we have some, yeah, also some testing pain in different areas. One part is, which is more the easier part is, I'm the only one developing on a Windows machine and everyone else is developing on Mac OS. So we had a lot of issues of these en environmental stuff. Um, so the easier one was file separators. Um, one we had also with Git. So um, it was not configured to use li proper line endings. So we were calculating a hash on a file. 
and it worked on, on a Linux machine, but the comparison failed on, on, on Windows because we had a different, got a different line separator or um, end of line on the Windows machine. And the more complicated tests are, um, yeah, also the asynchronous test on, on the actor system we use. So it's, um, they were working with timeouts of some seconds. And on the continuous integration, these tests start to fail when other tests are running because the CPU is um, too loaded. So <laughs> we also get very flaky tests, and this is quite annoying. So um, I think you can't cover it with randomized testing. That's more a problem of test environments and scheduling tests that they are, they are running in the right order. Yeah. Actually... Actually, we had, we had similar um, problems as well running, like we had configured our tests to run with a range of nodes, of Elasticsearch nodes. And we, for some of the cloud instances, the cloud instances actually were too small to host all these nodes on them, so they were running into all sorts of different timeouts. Another issue we ran into was that some of our build engineers were trying out new environments. And so, of course, we're generating all sorts of errors because they were not yet done, but the errors went to the development mailing list. So every developer was like, oh my god, something's wrong. No, it's not. Someone's trying stuff out and they didn't tell us up front. <laughs> So I'm out of t-shirts, but I still have sucre here, which you can squeeze and squish, and it, it turns into plastic. If you have funny stories, I'm a happy taker. <laughs> Otherwise, I've got a few questions. Um, I've talked a lot about the randomized testing frameworks that you use. How many of you are Java developers? Those who are not. <laughs> Do you know of similar frameworks of your favorite um, programming language? Anyone? No one? Really? Um, how many of you are open source developers? So many non-open source developers at FOSCON. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you get infected. <laughs> Um, so one thing I've seen in the Hadoop community is that, so they take patches, uh, but each patch that they get through Jira is being automatically run, applied to the system, run the tests against, and you get an automated um, report. How many of you do that? One, two, three. Can you tell me the project? Uh, it's the Ubuntu project and okay. the uh, core apps for the phone, and they have set the backend instance. And the tests are run automatically one, uh, once one proposal emerges. Um, can, you t can you tell us more about the implications? Does it have a good I impact on how many patches you get or how, how fast mm -hmm. feedback goes out? Yeah, it's noticeable that um, the code quality improves oh. be because uh, you detect a lot of issues when <coughs> the commits are made. Okay. There was someone up there. Yeah. Using ProCI with uh, cover all sorts of storage. Okay. Client code example for all sorts of storage. Uh huh. Uh, implications or something you noticed when switching it on? Yeah. Okay. Someone over there was also. I think you. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there was one project that did some kind of recommendation for testing. It was a server at the time, but it was immediately that fixed the feedback to write about uh, doing the um, difficult task to get. Okay. Um, any, so I've heard about it only last week. Anyone here heard about mutation testing? Yes, what's your experience with it? Uh, more on the fuzzing, more on the fuzzing side. Uh, I'm I use the Go programming language, and uh, Dimitri has this fuzzer, uh, Go fuzz, and it'll more or less be guaranteed to find bugs in your program. 
Have you used it yourself? Yeah, yeah, it's it's super easy to use, um, but it'll it'll totally crash your program. So. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone else over here. I don't remember the face. Yes. Is it complicated to mutate? You have to build up stack of uh, inputs to mutate and to generate, generate it. And uh, um, issue is this to track back uh, what was the problem and what crushed my uh, plans. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Let me check. Ah, one last question. Uh, when we set up our built environment in AWS, we started doing it mostly manu manually just to get it up and running. And then we added more one more instance for that operating system, one more instance for another operating system, one more instance for another JVM. Right now, we are at the point where doing all of this manually doesn't work anymore. How many of you went through the trouble of scaling your testing infrastructure in AWS and ended up using something like Puppet Chef, whatever, what have you? Anyone? No one? Yes, dumb one. <laughs> yes, where I work um, at the Bank of New Zealand, um, there's a team called the DevOps guy, which surely you know here as well, and they sort of take care of that kind of thing. They use Puppet to stand up environments for us, so us as the development teams, and I'm not entirely sure how exactly it works. We make requests and say, hey, we need another test environment, and then I don't know, a few hours later, it's there. So, yeah, it, it seems to work really, really well if people know how to use Puppet. Yeah. And I think and it didn't take them very long, maybe a few days to yeah. get used to it. But it seems to be the way to go um, comparing it to the past where yeah. you would wait for weeks and weeks and it's still not work. A few hours really sounds like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you don't have any more questions, this is from my side and you can go and have some coffee. <laughs> Um, there's more super here, there's more stickers here, take some. <laughs>